to a global multi-channel media brand. Under her leadership, CNEN has received a number of accolades and awards, recognizing its editorial leadership, design, multimedia products, innovative culture, and more. Prior to joining CNEN, Dr. Campbell Seho was editor in chief of Chemistry World and Magazines, publisher at the UK's Royal Society of Chemistry. And uh, earlier in her career, she worked as an editor of portfolio of pharmaceutical titles at Advanced Star Communications and as a technical editor at the European Respiratory Society. She holds a BSc in chemistry from the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain and a PhD in chemistry by the Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. Uh, so let's begin with the session. Uh, you all can post your doubts in the chat box or un unmute at the end of the uh, session. So um, maybe without any further ado, I invite you, ma'am, Dr. Viviana, to continue. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, having me uh, here to, today. And congratulations on, on being the uh, uh, first um, student chapter at uh, uh, you know pharma pharmacology uh, uni university. I'm excited, you know, to be to be talking to you. It's about eight o'clock in the morning here in the in the in the US, uh, and I know it's your your evening. So so bear with me. I'm I'm going to try to make this uh, talk as, as as interesting and as uh, lively as, as as possible. Please uh, ask any questions as 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 we go. I'll try to keep an eye on the the chat, but uh, you know it's it's okay to also. Um, interrupt so um just just to kind of like go over over some of the things that the the um, uh, introduction so i'm i'm um i'm living now in the in the us but i i was um in the uk and i was talking to to some of your colleagues uh, just before before we started the the the, the, the broadcast about um uh, you know the uh, cricket so uh, i i lived in the uk for about 14 years uh, before before that, my reason to go to the UK from Spain, where I am uh, originally from, was a um, an Erasmus program, which is a, a European exchange between universities. So you basically go for one year to a, a university in another country, and there's an exchange of students between um, uh, collaborating uh, organizations. And um, so I went to the UK, uh, to Manchester in particular, uh, for one year originally, and then I I never I never went back uh, to to Spain because I um I, I then stayed to do a, a PhD uh, there, and then I started working. I I went into the you know, the publishing world. I was uh, working in, you know my first job within the publishing world was as a as a technical editor. So I started in the uh, journals uh, and understanding you know the peer review process and you know how. And articles are commissioned, and how they are, you know, a, a made part of a of a of a of a of a, of a journal. How the you know the publication uh, process there works, and then I moved to um, uh, just kind of like magazine publishing uh, first with a commercial organization called Advanced Star, and then I uh, went to work with the Royal Society of of Chemistry, which is, um, of course, you know, today is a competing organization with ACS, but it's also a, a friend of, of of ACS, right? So, you know, because those uh, um, ACS, American Chemical Society and Royal Society of Chemistry, of course, um, have, you know, very strong publishing programs. So there's some, uh, you know, competition there for, you know, talent and manuscripts and, and, and that kind of thing. But also there's a lot of collaboration in different aspects of, of what we do. And, and, you know, me personally, having worked there for about six years, I hold, hold them very dear in my heart. So, um, I, you know, I do, I do have a great relationship there. In, in any case, so now I work at the American Chemical Society. I've been there for about six years this December. So a few you know, weeks ago, it was my sixth um, year uh, anniversary. And, and basically, I'm in charge of chemical and engineering news. I will probably refer to it as C and E N because that's the way we, we generally talk about it. Um, and basically, um, as you know, was said in the introduction, we cover all kinds of um, uh, events and activities and news and research that has to do with the chemical sciences in general. We cover education, business, um, you know, what is happening in industry, trends, uh, we do our outlooks. Uh, we also cover diversity within the chemical sciences, of course, very, very important. Um, and of course, in the last year, we have done a lot of coverage on, on COVID uh, that really has uh, dominated the, 
the you know the, the conversation and our our work for the last year or or so. But um, and in any case, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, you know information, you know about what what I do. But the the topic of the talk today is about. Um, effective communication uh, and how being an effective communicator makes for a better scientist. And I, I do believe this, and, and I think that I'm not alone there. We, you know, a lot of uh, scientists, a lot of chemists understand that this uh, is, a, is a crucial skill to have or to develop and um, I know that you know universities and organizations around the world are spending a lot of time effort and, and money training their their researchers their students uh, to be effective communicators because they see how important it is to be you know a successful um, a chemist and scientist so here's kind of like my my kind of uh, opening statement right Science communications is part of a scientist's everyday life. We do this every day. We educate, we influence, we communicate science to other scientists, to the general public, to policymakers. And to be successful, scientists must learn how to communicate effectively. A lot of people find it very easy, it's very natural to, to them. Uh, and uh, you know, for others, it is not, but it's a very um, useful skill to, to have because I think uh, there are many benefits uh, that you can uh, benefit from. Uh, so why it is, is, is important and you know here I just put this t-shirt that says because science is kind of obvious right uh, effective communication communication of science is important because science is is, is important um, that's it but you know from a, from a personal perspective, how is how is this important to to you, right? And I think that there's a lot of uh, different benefits. I, I would say that one that is very interesting is it will give you being an effective communicator, a communicator, and being impactful in 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 the ways that you communicate will help you establish more and more successful collaborations and partnerships. We all remember the first talk that we saw at an ACS national meeting, for example, or at a meeting of another kind. And, you know, we, we all remember the people who were the most um, articulate and the people that had the charisma. And, and of course, if there is some good science there to be shared, then it's kind of like a, it's, it's kind of like a luxury, right? It's a gift. Um, and, you know, we all want to be surrounded by those, those, those people. And, and I, I know of many collaborations that started uh, because somebody walked up to you know a speaker at a conference and said I love what you're talking uh, about uh, you know, I love the way you're presenting your results results I'm working in the same area can we work to together that that is you, you know something that happens very often so you know that's a, that's an opportunity more and more successful uh, partnerships it will also benefit you in that you know when you're trying to establish your research group it will help you attract the best talent uh, because you know it, it really again is a co collaboration of, of, of other kind. You know, it's more of a um, mentorship, right? When you have students that are you know working for 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 you, but they want to be with somebody that has that um, you know that charisma and that uh, you know ability to um, make others feel passionate about about uh, science. Um, I think the, the next benefit that I, I would say that is very important is the ability to secure research funds and, and grants. The better that you are able to talk about your science and how impactful it is for society, um, the, the better you will be at attracting funds from different agencies. There's no, no doubt about that. And the better you will be at influencing policymakers, which in a way is kind of like a closed circle because the, the you know the more that you you they see the, the passion and how important it is to invest in a specific area of science, the more that policymakers will be uh, you know the more money that they will be pushing in that direction, which then means that you know there's more funds and grants and and money available for you to continue that area of, of research. So so for, from that perspective, the ability to t speak to government. Uh, and you know, and convince them to um, spend on you know drug development or um, clean clean energy, for for example, is uh, something that is going to be uh, you know very important again to uh, secure funds and, and and overall kind of like that visibility for your your area of, of research. Uh, another benefit of 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 you know effective communication, so why it is important, is because it, it makes you. 
a better educator. And education is so important because this is going down to children and you know and young people who are starting in uh, in science in chemistry and, and again it's about inspiring them about understanding how science is is done um and and i think that again is probably one of the most crucial uh um you know areas where where uh, effective communication is really important because here you're talking to people who have a very open mind right if you're talking about children or young uh, adults they have a very open mind. They want to learn. There, you know, there's a thirst or a hunger for 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 knowledge, and I think that it is, uh, you know, you can be very impactful if if you are a, a good communicator. So there's an opportunity to really inspire a whole generation uh, by your words and in, in the way that you uh, talk about your your science. And then ultimately, when we talk about the, the the public, and you know, we kind of like you know talk about you know the the society in general, you have an opportunity alongside thousands of chemists and scientists around the, the world and especially in your country to change the public perception of uh, science and of scientists. And I would say that now, you know, with uh, COVID, I think we're seeing a little bit of, of, of this where the communication of, of science around the, you know, the pandemic is, is very important so that, you know, people follow guidelines, first of all, so that they, they understand why they ha have to wear a mask, the, why they need to wash their, their hands, how to stop the spread of the disease, how the virus works. And I think that now we're getting into the stage when vaccines are available. And I think it's going to be again crucial that scientists and, 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 and scientists that have that can communicate effectively come forward and talk to the general public about the benefits of vaccination so that we can go back to life you know, as normal as, 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 as soon as possible. So um you know, we, you know, from the, the the point of view of public perception of science and, and being effective communicators, we are we are in a very crucial, um, you know, point in in, in time. Uh, so so it, you know, kind of like that was my opening statements. No, so why it's important to be a good uh, science uh, communicator and how uh, science communication makes better scientists and you know the, all the, the benefits why it's it's important. I wanted to kind of like give you a number of e examples of um, some of the in, in my in my view some of the, the the best living scientists with the best oh, sorry. Um, the best uh, living uh, chemists uh, today, and how uh, effective uh, you know they are at communicating their their research. So I put here George Whitesides because he was one of the first uh, you know people that I I saw when I was uh, you know traveling again to an, an ACS national meeting, and I was blown away by how eloquent uh, he was. Um, I actually remember there was a a session. I think it was one of the lectures that he gave maybe about five years ago, probably 2015 or 16. And there was a room that was full, uh, hundreds of people were in that room. There was an overflow room <laughs> that was also full. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know, maybe 800, 900 people that were listening to this man talking about, about chemistry. And uh, the reason why I chose him is because, um, you know, he, he, he gave, gave me and, and others, uh, you know, some interesting tips about how to talk about um, science and, and, and chemistry. And, you know, he, he, he was quite funny about this. And I remember uh, uh, him talking about, you know, how one of the, the perils of, of middle age of becoming old is that you're invited to dinner parties. Right. And, uh, you know, generally, you know, when you sit uh, with with people that, that, that you don't know, they ask you what you do. Right. And of course, you know, you're very proud and you say, well, you know, I'm a chemist. I work on um, uh, statins and and then you go on and describe what statins do and, and then you lose them because then you start getting into the science and, uh, and you know, what they do, how they, they affect your, your body, how they, they, they control or manage the, the, the disease. And it just gets too complicated. You know, there's a lot of people who they, you know, they hear chemistry or science and they shut down completely. And, and then he said, you know, he, I don't do that anymore. I, I, don't, I don't do that now. I use kind of like shock tactics and I don't tell them I'm a chemist. I say to them, we, chemists, change the way you die. 
right? So he was, you know, if you're, if you're developing drugs for cholesterol or, you know, heart uh, disease or, uh, you know, a lot of other diseases rather than saying, this is what I do and, you know, you know and, and talking about the, the, um, the, 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 the drugs or the, the mechanisms of the disease, then, you know, his, his tactic is to now say, we change the way you die, right? Uh, you know, we can prolong your life, we make your life better because of, you know, the way that the drugs help you, uh, you know, uh, manage your symptoms and, and those kinds of things. And I thought that that was a very interesting way of um, kind of like in a way, you know, changing the way the conversation goes in a way that you go from just, you know, you're virtually giving the same information, but in, in the first case, people switch off. In the second case, people are interested, they are engaged because where you're going to tell me about how you're making you know my life better, how you're making it possible for my dad that has diabetes or my mom that has heart disease to survive or live live longer, and then all of a sudden, all, all, all of a sudden, you have that that engagement from your your listener uh, because the 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 way that the you know um, information is presented is 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 very different. Uh, if you haven't seen his TED talk, he's great. He talks. He talks about simplicity, which is uh, which is which is really really good. Um, anyway, so I, I would yeah, it's on on YouTube, so you can very easily find that. But um, anyway, this is just one example of an outstanding scientist. I believe that for many years he had the 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 biggest H index. So you know, theoretically, if you go by that measure, the the the, the most successful chemist in the world. Uh, and he's a phenomenal communicator. He's, you know, very charismatic. Um, oops. Oh, here's another one. This is Caroline Bertosi. Uh, she, she is phenomenal, a force of uh, nature, again, linked to ACS. She's the editor-in-chief of ACS Central Science, one of our um, open access journals. And she's phenomenal. I've seen her talk uh, several times as, as well. And, um, uh, she's great. I think my money is on her to win a Nobel Prize within the next five years. So uh, <laughs> you can, you know, in five years we can get together again and see if this uh, became a, a reality. But I, I think she'll, I think she'll, she'll, she'll do it. Um, and why I put it, her here is because I mean I think she's a a, a very good communicator, uh, but also because I learned from from her. Uh, and you know she has a you know very you know long successful career not only as a as a chemist biologist but also an entrep entrepreneur, um, but also she, you know she 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 gave us some some tips. We we did a science communication workshop several years ago, again at an ACS national meeting, and we had her and also Dan Nocera, who is um, doing you know work on um, artificial leaf and you know clean energies, and then we also had Deborah Bloom, who is a, a Pulitzer. A prize winner. She's a, a, an author and, and, and writer, phenomenal communicator. Of, of course, that's, that's her, her job and her, her training. And, um, and along the lines of what George Whitesides was just saying in terms of kind of like shocking people into listening and engaging with, with you, um, she also said that she changed the way she talks about what she does. Uh, she doesn't say, oh, you know, I'm a, a chemist and, you know, biologist and I work on bioorthogonal chemistry. Uh, because nobody would understand what that means, she says, "I work for you. You know, I I work to make your life better. I'm working on some, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, drugs and, and you know, uh, you know, to work on um, uh, cancer and other diseases. I look at you know the the surface of the cells and you know the sugars and and all all that kind of thing. And so, but she starts with the I work for you. I work to make your life uh, better. So it's, you know, similar kind of like, you know, school of thought as uh, white sides. Um, so that's when she talks to, you know, people from, you know, general public, again, you know, dinner parties and kind of um, those kinds of, of conversations. Uh, but she also gives us some, some tips about how she approaches uh, working with uh, policymakers. You know, very often um, some of the you know scientists around the United States are called to go to um, Washington D.C. here uh, to so that you know policymakers can learn about science. You know what is what is happening, what is big in terms of um, uh, science uh, research. You know what's the 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 trends. You know what's coming up, kind of like you know blue sky thinking and and, and that kind of thing. And um, 
you know, and, and again, she used to originally kind of like explain, you know, in kind of what she thought was basic terms with the science that she does, but the people that she was talking to are lawyers and, uh, you know, they're not, not, they don't have like, you know, kind of like even a basic um, scientific training. So again, she kind of like engaged some kind of like shock uh, tactics as well, where, you know, rather than talking about, you know, for example, you know, cancer or heart disease or, you know, mortality and for certain um, conditions and then, you know, the, the, um, how, it, how important it is to invest in uh, development of, of drugs to manage those, those diseases. She would look at a group of, you know, five people say, you know, front row that were kind of like facing her as she was talking and saying, uh, you know, uh, if there's 10 people, seven of you we, will die before you reach the age of 65, three of you will suffer cancer within your lifetime, two of you are going to have, you know, heart disease and probably won't make it, uh, you know, you won't, you know, survive the next five years. And then she ends with, who is it going to be? And, and then, you know, again, her, she could see in their thinking, okay, so am I the one that dies of, of cancer before reaching the age of 65? Or, you know, I really, my, my you know, I'm taking already, you know, blood uh, pressure, you know, medication. I am the one that is going to, you know, be suffering from this and that and the other. And, uh, and, 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 and again, she, she, she saw that by changing the, the way she was approaching that kind of like initial engagement with them, that they were really more receptive to what she was trying to say. So, um, uh, again, I thought that, that was a really interesting way of, of looking at science uh, communication, and in, specifically in this case with policymakers who don't have a um, scientific training. And not only that, I mean, they, they are only going to be in their jobs for a certain number of, of, of years. They need to make, a, make an impact now, soon. They don't think very often long, long term because, you know, the political terms are four or five years. And therefore, from that perspective, you know, you need to be pretty uh, uh, kind of like, I, I guess that keep it simple uh, and make it easy for them to understand how important it is uh, that they, they put the money in the right places in terms of investing, you know, for research. Uh, and then here I have, you know, two more examples of uh, uh, science communicators. And I picked a lot of a lot of women because really these women are um, exceptional. So this is Frances Arnold and Jennifer Dudna. So both of them have Nobel uh, Prizes. Uh, Dudna was 2020, so this year, a few months ago. And uh, Frances Arnold, I believe she received it in 2018, if I'm, if, if I'm right. Um, I've seen them both um, uh, give talks in a number of occasions. I would say Frances Arnold, you have to watch <laughs> her Nobel uh, address. Um, I saw her giving a similar talk at a, an ACS uh, meeting as, as well, and I was impressed by how precise uh, she, she was. Every, every word is, is what it should be. It's incredible the way she thinks and the way that she delivers her message is phenomenal. And Jennifer Dudna uh, uh, impressed me because she made the difficult sound very simple. And when she talks about, about CRISPR, how they came up with the um, you know, the, the idea and you know, the, 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 how they developed the technology. She's just incredible. And she, she, she talks about her uh, discovery with a, a huge humility. And that is, that is great to, to, to see. And, and I, I think that, you know, again, YouTube, you will see a lot of you know, presentations from, from them. And I think that they have really good um, style uh, uh, in both of them. And of course, in the background, we've got Mr. Uh, Albert Einstein, uh, who is, of course, no longer with us. But I, I picked a, um, a kind of a quote from him, where uh, I, which I think is, is, is interesting, and I think that um, uh, you know we can we can learn from it. Uh, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself, right? So you know, in a way, I think that he is pretty clear that <coughs> excuse me, science. <clears throat> should be made accessible and should be uh, explained in a way that uh, people who are not scientists can uh, understand it so that they know about the impact of the work that, that we do. Okay, so, excuse me, I'm going to take a little bit of water. So, we talked about science uh, communication, what is important, and I gave you a lot of examples of um, good science communicators and, and why they're they are good. 
And I would say that there are exceptions to, to this. And the first one that I put here, I think he's an exception, uh, the Sharples, who got a Nobel Prize in 2001, I believe, um, who is an outstanding scientist, but he doesn't enjoy the limelight. It's not that he's a bad communicator, but he doesn't enjoy, you know, being in a in a room with, you know, 400 or, you know, 700 people listening to, to, to him. And uh, I had the opportunity to see him, he's uh, giving his um, address as a priestly um, medalist. And, and that was, that was uh, brilliant. I, I think he's outstanding. And I think he's one of a kind. And, um, and, and I think that he is somebody who thinks in very different ways. I think the best way I can describe this is that we, the majority of us think linearly and he doesn't, he thinks, he, his thought process is, is kind of like hopping. And, and, and you can see it when you, when you, when you talk to him because he, he is, he's kind of like hopping from one, one topic, from one area to, to, to the other. And it's, it's very interesting. I've never experienced anything like that, but he's extraordinary, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, I'm going to take some more water. So I would say that he's a little bit of an exception in that um, he's an outstanding chemist, chemist that doesn't enjoy uh, doing uh, science communication. But then there's obviously a lot of average scientists that are average communicators. And I think that, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of young people, uh, you know, listening now. And I would like to encourage you all to invest in in your presentations, in your communications, make, make them the best that they can be. Because, uh, you know, it's about how impactful you are with your, um, with your, your science. And, and, and I think that that is, uh, is, is, is very important for the reasons that I, I, are, I outline. It will make you more successful, the more of a handle that you have on how you present your science and how you present yourself. So with that, I wanted to give you some idea of how we communicate science at ACS because we, we of course, we're a membership organization made up of chemists from all over the, the world, but we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort communicating science. And, and so here, you know, I kind of like I was trying to kind of describe the, the, the breadth of, of what we do because we have people working on everything from scholarly communications to, you know, the kind of like the other side of the spectrum, the you know, public communications and influencing policymakers. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, um, the different groups that are, you know, working together here. So, so if you look from the, from the left-hand side, ACS publications, that's the, that's the department or the division that I'm, I'm part uh, of. But here, um, there, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the journals. So ACS has about 70 journals that, they, that we publish at, at, at the moment. And that is kind of like hardcore scholarly communications, you know, proper manuscripts um, that are kind of like very formulaic in the, the way that they are you know, produced. We have a very large team of, of people handling the uh, peer review process, also commissioning uh, research from, uh, you know, people giving talks at, at uh, uh, you know conferences, uh, we also you know publish uh, books uh, and uh, and you know uh, all, all those kind of like I would say that the more niche kinds of com communications they 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 handle you know that's they are experts. A majority of them have you know PhDs in some area of of, uh, of of science, if not if not chemistry. Working with them very very often are is the group of scientific advancement and, 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 and membership. Uh, th these guys uh, do a lot of uh, uh, work in terms of the uh, ACS national meeting. <clears throat> so that's an opportunity for scientists to present their their research. And again, this is kind of like I would say like kind of like hard course science. Uh, and you know some of that work is. Um, Commission, or you know, it comes from scientists from around, around the world, and it's presented at the and, and national meetings. So that's posters. <coughs> Excuse me. Posters, uh, presentations, uh, talks, uh, and then there are, in some cases, proceedings out of out of the talks. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh God, I'm, 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 my throat is going now. Uh, CNN, this is my, my group, the rocket that they're in, in, in the middle. So we do kind of like the, the, the fun of science communications because we're kind of like the more uh, popular 
uh, science, if, if you like. So uh, we, we produce a magazine on a on a weekly basis. Weekly, uh, uh, also we publish news uh, daily. We have uh, all kinds of different platforms to out output this content. We have a website, we have an app, we have a digital edition, we do podcasts, we do videos, um, all those kinds of things. And I would say that what, what we do in, in a way is, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the science, the hardcore science that groups like ACS Publications and Scientific Advancement, you know, produce or, or solicit, we, we make it more accessible. Um, for uh, generally members of, of, of the community that are not working in, in the specific area of, of science. So when you move from left to right, it goes from less accessible to more accessible. And we're kind of like in, in the middle. Uh, we write for around kind of like, um, you know, student of chemistry level science. So we assume some, some knowledge, but we spend time, uh, you know, de-jargoning. Uh, a lot of the the work that is published in the you know in the in the scientific literature, uh, and then as you move uh, to the other side of the spectrum, we have the folks from education who have a number of, of magazines for graduates and undergraduates as well. So that's kind of like you know very kind of basic uh, science, introducing uh, a, a lot of people for first time to to chemistry. Uh, and then we have the, the group who do external affairs and, and communications and, and their, their audience is the general public. So their, their work is to um, uh, talk about the, a lot of the research that is published within ACS uh, publications and in the national meeting and make it available to uh, members of the public. They do videos and all those kinds of things. They also work with the media. So they uh, then again, again digest this uh, research so that it is um, comprehensible for members of the media who, again, may not be experts. And then they do a lot of work with the policymakers uh, as, as well to, uh, you know, explain how chemis chemistry transforms uh, uh, lives. So uh, again, you know, you have the whole spectrum from, you know, the kind of like hardcore uh, scientific to the, you know, the, 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 the general public. And then within ACS, we cover we cover all the different aspects. Uh, so sometimes you know this you know we shift from from you know one one side to to the other. But in general, you know this is more or less how we are how we are distributed. Uh, so this is what we do at ACS. So there's about yeah two thousand people. But I guess that you know in this in this um, uh, you know groups that I, I explained here, there's about maybe five to six hundred people you know doing this 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 work. Uh, but uh, this is something that you know that 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 you as a as a chemist uh, you know and, and as a as a body in science uh, communicator, you're probably going to uh, have to uh, try to to do on your own, right? Um, uh, you know, and it will be important to again, as I said before, to invest into uh, trying to you know get the, the tools and techniques that allow you to to do so. Because in a, in a way, you know, you're probably through your career going to be in a position where you have to do everything from. <laughs> writing a scientific journal and um you know to doing outreach with a school or you know some, something like that so you will go from one side of the spectrum to 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 the other so um let's talk about science communications um, um <clears throat> Uh, because as, as I was saying, you, you'll have to do many of these uh, through your, your career. And I, I wanted to, to kind of like, in, in a way, break them down into technical and non-technical. And in a way, these are probably representative of the two sides of the spectrum from scholarly to, you know, kind of public communication. The technical communication is, is, is hard, but, you know, if you, if you are doing a, a, a chemistry degree or you're going to do a graduate degree, you probably within the next two to three years are going to be writing a research article, an abstract, certainly a poster, probably a conference presentation, and then a, a thesis for, for, for sure. Uh, so that's that's coming you know, your way soon. Uh, and then after that, you'll potentially have to go and, and do a, a job interview. And I put that here as a uh, technical communication because you know you'll you'll be asked about specific uh, scientific knowledge you know very often uh, so uh, and you'll be talking to somebody who understands what you're what, you know what you're what you're talking about right um, so that is something that you're probably either doing or going to be doing very very soon 
Uh, and then on the other side, you have the non-technical communication. So it could be that you're writing a news article for, you know, as part of your, your degree. I know that you have, you know, competitions in, in the exit. AWSAR, I, I've heard about this competition from the DST. Uh, or you could be, you know, blogging, or you could be writing for your you know, university new, newspaper. You also, you know, could be developing your elevator pitch, similar to the, um, you know, what uh, George Whitesides and Caroline Bertosi were talking about. You know, what do you see, see, say at dinner parties that that, that you do? Uh, so again, that's non-technical. Then infographics. A lot of, you know, people are trying to do that. Uh, working with your, um, if you have at uh, your universities, um, uh, press officers who work on, you know, press releases. Again, this is for the media. Uh, briefing the government again, so talking to non-specialists. Uh, social media, uh, and I hope that you're doing that now. It could be that you haven't done any of the others uh, up to up to this moment, but social media, you should be, you know, hopefully uh, distributing or sharing uh, about your your research. And then you know potentially doing an interview with a news uh, outlet with uh, like like CNN for for example. So um, those are all the different types of communications that certainly uh, you know some again you're probably doing or going to be doing very soon, and you're very likely to meet them you know during the, the length of your your career. Uh, so important to kind of like familiarize yourself with all of them. Uh, it is a, a time and, and, and a place for, for each. You don't have to be doing all of those at the same time. It, it depends on your audience and the context, right? Uh, so in, with, you know, with respect to technical communications, remember we were talking about a thesis, abstract, uh, conference presentation, job interview. Uh, very often you do this to disclose your finding to relevant research communities. It could be your colleagues, it could be at a conference. Uh, you could also use these communications to secure funding. So when you talk to funding agencies, again, you need to explain your research and its impact very often to experts in the, the area because they are, they are, the grants are peer reviewed. Uh, and then support career advancement for yourself and your collaborators through uh, job interviews, but also establishing collaborations. So that's technical communications. Uh, Non-technical, um, again, we're talking about infographics, elevator pitch, uh, you know, news article. That's more about informing the general public of the purpose and importance of your, your work. Very important is uh, also, it, you can use it to promote the value of, of science to uh, governments and, and help ensure funding globally, raise right? the uh, influence in the policymakers. And then we were what we were talking about earlier, which is educating, right? Uh, 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 um, engaging students and, and making them feel passionate about science and chemistry. So uh, as I said, you don't have to do them all at the same time, but you'll probably, you know, through your, your career, if you're an educator, or if you work in, in industry, you'll be doing several of, of, of those, uh, you know, in, in a given uh, day. And, and, and I think what's important to do and to remember is that, you know, as, as you're working on your communications, you should be keeping a number of things in, in mind. You should be asking yourself a number of questions uh, to make sure that your communication is as, as effective as, as possible. And, and I think that you will achieve that if you keep in mind what your audience needs. And I think that this is the most important question of all. Who, who is my audience? Who am I, who am I writing? Uh, sorry, who am I talking to? Who am I communicating with? And what is the take home message? Why am I talking to them? Why is it important that I tell them about what I'm, what I'm, I'm doing? Um, then I would ask myself, am I being clear? Uh, you know, it's not just the, the, the grammar. Am I, am I um, you know, uh, using jargon that maybe kind of like obscures what I'm, what I'm trying to say? Is it interesting, right? I mean, uh, there's a lot of science that is kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, but there's an, an improvement. It may advance. A field, but it might not be uh, all that that impactful. We need to we need to be mindful of that because then you know you need to make sure that you 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 make that part of your your communication. Um, what should the reader remember? That's kind of like the takeaway home. Sorry, the take home message that I was talking about before. Am I being true to my voice? Um, I think that this is important as well because we are trained to write these communications in a specific way, and I think that very often we lose the personality. Of the researcher or the groups of or group of researchers that is you know creating this communication, and I, I think that that is a, a, a mistake. I think that in some way, some ways we have to very often follow guidelines. But your your voice can come through. You can you know by your choice of 
title, for example, or the way that the format that you use to deliver your communication. And I think that, you know, for example, for um, oral communications is where you have probably the greatest freedom in terms of, you know, allowing your voice to, to shine through. Uh, is it well written? You know, good English, of course, very uh, important, grammatically correct. It needs to have a theme and a story. Very important that there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, that you answer the basic questions, the what, the why, how. Am I providing enough information? And this is a tricky one, and this is one that we struggle with, and my team are, you know, very experienced. But are we pitching the story at the right level so that the audience doesn't get um, patronized, right, or that they think it's, it's boring because it's not... Um, we don't provide enough enough sophistication to to make it interesting uh, to, to them. So that's that's a fine balance to to strike, and I think that that's a, an interesting one. That you know, to this day, you know, people in my my team and me personally, sometimes we we struggle struggle with that. And then, am I engaging with listeners uh, or, or readers? And I would say that specifically, you know, for um, you know, live presentations when you're doing uh, presentations in a in a in a meeting. You know things like uh, dressing appropriately, of course, but also um, you know eye contact. Uh, you, you know, just um, looking at people in the in the room. Make sure that you you read the room. You understand how they are feeling about the the research that you're you're presenting. That's that's very important as well. Those are, are you know the kinds of questions that you need to ask yourself as you uh, you know develop your your message as you develop your your communication. Um, so I want to leave you with some kind of like the, the seven commandments of uh, science communication. And, and, and many of these rules kind of like derive from the questions that I was just, just uh, showing you, but in a way uh, it kind of like puts them in, in almost in, in, in order. And I would say that these um, seven rules or, or commandments as, as, as I call them, uh, they apply to any kind of co communication, whether it is a, a paper, or whether it is a conference or whether you're talking to policymakers, the process is, is this, the same. The output will be uh, different, but uh, it is, is you know, something that you know, if, you, if you really get the handle of, of, of it, your, your communications will be very in, impactful and achieve the desired effect. So let's go through them. So I guess that the first thing to, to do is to draft an outline. You know, when you're asked to you know, create a, a manuscript or uh, a a presentation, think about, you know, what data do I have and what is my data telling me, right? What's my, what's my, my story? You know, you have to kind of like put everything on, on, on the table and start looking at, you know, the trends, you know, and the ideas that you can explore in that, in that communication. You need to be able to answer the why, why, what, how questions. So why did I do this? What does does it do? How does does it advance the field? And you know how did I do it? So it's kind of like you know the, the process or the procedure uh, to, to to do that. Uh, so that's the first step. Look at the data and look look at what the data tells you, and start kind of like identifying a narrative uh, there. Uh, and, you know this is uh, in parallel. You need to choose the, the journal if it is a manuscript, or or you know, whether it is a conference. Uh, for example, uh, carefully. And what I mean by this is that very often um, scientists, you know, are kind of like lured by the appeal of the um, uh, journals with high impact factors, for example. And I would say that the, the scope of the journal is more important than the impact factor. And I think from that, from that perspective, it's about impact. It's about reaching the people for which your research will be impactful and it will be interesting. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, again, that is that requires you to do a little bit of, of work if you don't have the experience, um, or, you know, or you don't know the, 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 the journal, you know, environment very well, you know, <clears throat> should you publish in JAX or should you publish on Lab on a Chip? Well, Lab on a Chip is a very kind of like niche type of publication, it has a high impact factor too, but it's all about microfluidics, microfluidics and that specific area of, of, of science. Uh, JAX is, is great, but it's very broad. I mean, a huge impact factor too. So those are the questions that you need to think about, you know, how, how am I uh, going to 
reach the audience uh, that I, I, I want to reach most effectively um, so that my research is, is as impactful as, as can be. And, and again, don't chase impact factors. I think that that is, a, in my view, some, is a, a, a mistake. Uh, and the same applies in, you know, if it is a, 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 you know, spoken communication or a, a, a poster, for example, as well. So, but where, where you're going to publish your, your uh, research very carefully. Um, then understand what is expected. Uh, expected. <clears throat> what I would say here is that the uh, the journals, uh, and, you know, from publisher to publisher, for sure, have different guidelines in terms of how to submit your research. They all do it differently. And even sometimes within the same publisher, there are different rules. So uh, again, that's an area where I would advise you to spend some time so that you know what you're, you're doing in terms of, um, you know, what the, 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 the guidelines uh, are uh, for, for you in terms of formats and, you know, how you submit your data and your supplementary information and all those those kinds of things. It's, 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 it's time consuming and it's pretty, boring because it's about you know rules and I, I that's the part that I, I I don't enjoy at all but it is it is part of the, the process unfortunately uh, for from a journal's perspective from a um, if, if we're talking about other kinds of communications for example I'm just thinking about you know if uh, uh, a publication uh, a magazine like CNN wanting to interview you, uh, I think that what would be important in terms of understanding what is expected is kind of like, uh, you know, talking about ground rules, right? Um, so I'm going to be talking to you and you're going to be recording the information, the, the conversation, right? That's okay, pretty much every journalist does that. Um, then, you know, will I be able to see the article before you publish it? Very often we don't allow that. Uh, so if it is important to you, then you need to negotiate that. Um, in advance, uh, or um, you know, if you work for a for a for industry for an organization, very often they, they have what I call the, the PR police. So they have you know the, the the press office and you know people who are trained, and they will want to be present for interviews. So that's something again that you need to negotiate you know internally with your organization, but also with the, the journalists. So you know this 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 you know it's not it's not trivial and there are things that may be important to you or to your organization and we need to make sure that those are all discussed in, in, in advance and you know so in a way establishing the, the ground rules understand what is um, expected. Um, that can happen in, in, in parallel. I would say the number four the number four rule this is the most important one tell a story. you're passionate about your science. you know your science better than anybody else right you're an, an expert make sure that that comes through right uh because that's the that's the most important part it's about engaging the the reader or the listener or the you know the the, the, the policy or somebody who is reading an infographic that you made they need to know why it is important how is this advancing the, the field how how me you know viviana as a mother of two kids for example why is it important to me you know why are you telling me, me this and from that perspective you need to be uh, sure that you know once you have uh, analyzed your data and you have you know the story to tell there is a, a very strong theme that holds your your story um then after that and that's i would say that that's the most crucial part i would say make it pretty but above all clear and, and I think that, you know, with that, uh, I can think of, uh, you know, a manuscript, for example, or an infographic as well, where, you know, obviously you want them to be, you know, uh, visually appealing, but they need to be clear. And I think that that's something where people struggle uh, sometimes where, you know, there's, there's uh, um, if you're using graphics, for example, for a presentation, make sure that the graphics support what you do and they're not in a so, sorry, support what you say, and they're not in addition to what you're saying, because I cannot hear and read and analyze the data that you're showing me at this, the same time. So if they are disconnected, I'm not going to be able to follow very well. So use them as you know props in your talk to help you develop a, a topic or a theme or an, a, an idea, but that you need to kind of like explain the graphic to your audience because uh, otherwise it's very difficult to to follow and I, I would say make them as as simple as as possible very often you know that they can be understood 
at a glance if something is increasing or decreasing or getting hot or cold or whatever. It needs to be you know, understood pretty much from the get-go so that people don't spend a lot of time trying to kind of like untangle the information that you're trying to uh, provide. And this is a very common uh, 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 error that, that, that I think my colleagues in the journal side, you know, they see this very often where, you know, in the, uh, the you know, the, the, in the, I guess that the desire to provide data, then it becomes a data dump and, and it's very difficult to un untangle and make the, the graphics and other materials uh, easy enough that they can, you know, uh, stand up on their own and have, you know, a, a, a single easy to understand message. Um, Make it memorable and compelling. Of course, there's a lot of scientists around the world. There's like, you know, millions of scientists, thousands of, of chemists. And, um, you know, and a lot of people spend a lot of time, you know, looking at the scientific literature, going to conferences. And I think that doing things like thinking a little bit outside the box in terms of your titles, for example, for your talks or, um, or for your papers, or looking at the format and what your you know you know possibilities are in terms of standing a little bit outside the the, the norm, it will it will help you. It will help you a, a bit because it will make it memorable. You know, most people, um, you know, if you go again to a, a national meeting by ACS, this you know very similar types of presentations. Um, it can be you know very bo boring by day two and day three for sure, because they are very similar. And if you can kind of like break away from that even a little bit, it will make it um, memorable and ideally, you know, compelling as, as well, where people will say, okay, now you have me, right? That title really is, is very interesting. Now, you know, tell me tell me more a, a, about it. So um, again, uh, you know, try to think a little bit outside the box. Um, and then the last one, review, edit and rework. <laughs> And again, this is a, a probably uh, difficult and I would say, you know, the most exciting part of the process as you kind of create your communications, but it is very important, you know, catching grammatical errors for sure. This happens at this stage when, you know, you are proofreading yourself and asking others to proofread. That's probably if you're writing a manuscript where you start getting a lot of feedback from your collaborators and it's important that their views uh, and, um, their input is reflected in the you know final final piece. Uh, this is the time when also you know if you are doing a, a, a presentation, an oral presentation, you are practicing. And, and I would advise you know that you practice if you can in front of other people. If it is an important uh, presentation, they will help you refine your um, your style, your you know your slides, and, and make sure that they. They, they work because they will be, you know, playing the role. You can do, you know, uh, role play with your colleagues and, and they can advise you uh, in terms of, again, the impact of the, the communication. But yeah, review, make sure that you involve other people, whether it is collaborators for sure, that's a, a must. <laughs> Never go ahead and publish um, anything where you use other people's names without asking for permission. And believe me, um, you know, it sounds like really obvious to say this, but it happens. <laughs> Some people do this uh, and it, then it's a surprise and then there's retractions and then there's, you know, collaborations that are broken because of, of things like that. So, um, you know, please make sure that you do that. Uh, and then that, you know, the final copy is clean. It adheres to the, uh, the uh, guidelines and, and, you know, formats that are um, kind of demanded or requested by the different publishers or by the different, um, you know, venues where you will be uh, publishing the, the data and uh, you know and then you know if if you can and I think that, that would be number eight uh, after this is you know promote um, through uh, social media or you know if you have a again a press office in your organization let them know that you are either publishing a paper or doing an interview or writing an article and so that you can actually again maximize the impact of your um, of your your communications so that would be in, in number eight if you actually had the opportunity to to, to do that, but uh, that's kind of like a, <laughs> a nice to have other than a, a, a must have. And that's kind of like promotion versus, you know, actually um, making impactful uh, communications. So with that, that's that's all I, I had for you. I, I would like to thank you for your time. I thought I hope that you learn uh, <laughs> something. Uh, but then I would take uh, any any questions. I've put my uh, email address there in case you want to ask me anything, and um, I'll, I'll be happy to um, again take questions now or in in the future if you if you want to do that. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Bibiana, for this wonderful and informative talk. You really inspired us and helped us understand by citing various scientists and successful scientists, the significance of simplicity in communicating science. And the seven rules of communication, we'll definitely keep them in mind uh, to enhance our research career ahead. So uh, let's begin with the Q&A session if we have any questions. Okay. Yeah, Aditi, uh, can you please read the question? We have one question. Okay, yeah, Kushali. Yeah, the question is, one common mistake young researchers do is over speculation or overestimation of an observation or a result that gives wrong message to the audience especially to the people from non-scientific background. How to keep that in mind while communicating the idea? Sorry, I couldn't find the, the, the button to unmute myself. I'm laughing because, you know, you say that is, you know, young uh, communicators or young researchers do this. It's, it's not just young <laughs> researchers, it's, it's everybody does that. And I, I would say actually that sometimes, you know, the, even the media, even, you know, my, my team again, you know, very highly trained, we really try to avoid hyping, you know, uh, uh, scientific uh, re results and it's difficult. Uh, and I think that that's where the training comes uh, in. So for example, from the point of view of, of, of the media, my team, uh, the majority of them are, have either a degree or a PhD in, um, uh, in, in a scientific area, generally chemistry, biochemistry, some you know, physics and that, that kind of thing. So, you know, and, and that's, that's why we, we do that. There are people who are trained um, to understand the specific area of, of science and hopefully avoid that, but of course, that's kind of our job. You know, from the point of view of um, researchers, kind of like over, uh, kind of like hyping research is 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 difficult. And what I would say here, um, I, I I would I would try to. I guess that to try to talk to other people, perhaps establish a, a mentorship rela relationship with somebody that, that you like, maybe a more you know, senior scientist that you admire, and, and, and maybe you know, ask them to you know, review the, the data. If you are, again, writing a, a, a paper, maybe your collaborators will help you get the tone right. Uh, uh, and, and I think that that very often is part of the editing process where um, you, know, you have a different groups of people with, with different areas of expertise and they will, you know, they will, they will help with, with that. Uh, but I, I would say that in, in that sense, you know, get more, more pairs of eyes on what you're trying to uh, deliver and, and, and see what their advice is. But the thing is, if, you, if, you, if you're worried about that, then you are likely to not do it because you are conscious uh, that that is a, a, a possibility. So uh, I think that yes, uh, you know, being aware, uh, you know, you're already in the, the right path to avoiding uh, over overhyping. Um, but I, again, I guess that the, 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 what I would say there is use the people around you uh, to gather feedback and make sure that, that you know, the, the message is what it should be. And, you know, if they're familiar with your research, they should be able to help a little bit. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, we have one more question coming. Could you please elaborate a bit more on be true to my voice? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's an, an interesting one. I think that there are some cases you, where you can do that more easily than others in terms of you know, the types of communications. I think if you're writing a manuscript, for example, it is harder because they're very um, prescribed in terms of the format. So you have an abstract, you have a title abstract, you know, keywords, and then, uh, you know, process or procedures, references. It is, it is harder there. But there are little things that you can do, like, you know, um, choice of title, for example, rather than going with, you know, super long titles, <laughs> you can go with something that is shorter uh, and that it could be 
you know, uh, either a little bit of funny or a play of words or some, something like that. It doesn't, I think, I think manuscripts and, 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 you know, papers that kind of scholarly communication that doesn't lend itself so much. I think if you're thinking about, you know, opinion pieces or, you know, a blog um, uh, article, for example, there you're talking about more your opinions so that you can do that. Um, I think that what I was, you know, perhaps where I, I, I was thinking that this could really be um, taken advantage of is in the, the, the live uh, presentations where really you can show your, your personality by choosing a different format or a different way of telling a story. Um, you know, start by the end rather than by the beginning, just because, you know, you can create a cliffhanger, you can be playful. Um, I think that the, because, uh, I think, it, again, we are trained to do things in a specific way. You know, when you go to a presentation, you probably have a PowerPoint that has a very set uh, uh, um, kind of like narrative let's let's say right so you have your title then you have your agenda the things that you're going to be talking about then you will talk about the what we did and then why we, we did it i think that that is important and then you know at the end you have some uh, thank yous and stuff like that and i think that's pretty much what we all say but within that i think that you can be you can use other artifacts you can play a video you can um you know bring you know if it is a, a, a live uh, um uh, presentation you can bring in a, a poster or bring in another person and then you know perhaps impersonate a conversation if that you, you know just just think outside the box make sure that you know that the personality your voice comes through and that you are you make it memorable just by by doing that I, I don't know if that explains it very well because it's difficult to talk in the in the abstract but I would say don't be afraid to do things a little bit different um, especially because you're you're learning, and some things will work, and some things will not not work. But uh, it is worth uh, trying. And, and again, there's some guidelines, but very often things are not written in stone in terms of you know communications. So um, yeah, just think a, a little bit outside the box. Thank you so much, ma'am. We have one more question. Also, what should we do to make sure the audience's attention stays on us? Because if they feel that the topic is not interesting enough or hard to understand, they might inevitably zone out. <laughs> yes, that happens a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, that's why I think that explaining it in simple terms and in, in terms that are, is important, you know, you have to make it important to them and say, you know. Again, you know, going back to uh, the Caroline Bertossi or George Whiteside's school of, of thought, you know, kind of say, you know, I can influence the way you die, right? You know, as a, as a chemist and, uh, you know, the work that I'm doing in drug discovery, I can, I can influence the way you die. I, that grabs anybody's attention. And, and I think that, um, you know, um, we need to, I think we need to work hard just because it's difficult it doesn't mean that it's not worth it i think it's very very worth it actually i would say that during covid we've seen that because people are scared and worried about their families and their well-being a lot of people are paying attention to science in a different way i mean if you for example in the united states everybody knows anthony fauci who is you know the kind of like the, the speaker uh, that president trump was kind of inviting to some of his talks, everybody knows him. I mean, he's a very high profile scientist that is in the, you know, the public eye. And then he talks about things like clinical trials and people now know that this is the, the process uh, that drugs have to follow through. And they know that it takes generally many, many years. And now it has taken less than a year to have viable vaccines. I think that's something that it is incredible that people know that. So in a way, if they tune out, out, it is our responsibility as scientists to, to make them tune back in again. And, you know, so we need to make it relevant to them. And of course, COVID is relevant to everybody around the world because, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a pandemic. But, you know, let's, let's think about some of the learnings from, from, from the pandemic and how people like Fauci has um, 
you know, gone publicly and spoken about something that is very complex that costs a lot of money, like, you know, developing a, a, a drug. Um, he's explained it in ways that people could understand, you know, what it meant that they had to be patient. It needs to be done properly. You know, there's, there's processes there to keep people safe and make sure that they, there's no, you know, side effects and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, uh, let's, let's work hard on, on, on that. A lot of people will tune out because sometimes, actually, I mean, I, what I, this is a strong opinion of, of mine and you might not agree with that. But if you, if you don't get uh, good educators early on, so my kids, for example, I'm, I'm, they, they already say that maths is difficult. Well, maths is not more difficult than anything else. It's just that it's different, right? But they hear their educators saying math is difficult. So they, they approach the subject with that frame of mind. And the, the same happens to chemistry. And it, I'll actually I'll give you an example. When I was in the UK, I was doing some um, work in the lab with a, uh, I was just demonstrating in the lab. So helping students, you know, get the experiments done. done. And there was this uh, young man who was, um, you know, very disengaged. And I said to him, you know, um, what's the problem? You know, why, why are you not helping your group um, finish this? And he said, I don't understand any of this. Uh, you know, this, this, I don't understand the question. I don't know why we're, we're doing this. Uh, I don't even understand the language. And then I thought, huh. Oh, interesting he uh, <laughs> they were talking about basic co concepts this was first year like catalyst and limiting reagent and he didn't know what those words meant and i said to him what well, do you cook can you bake and he said yeah I, I am a good baker and i said well you know just think about a cake that you're baking if you have uh, so say you need two eggs and half a kilo of flour and half a kilo of sugar so if you have two eggs and you had six kilos of flour and six kilos of, flu, uh, of uh, sugar, how many cakes can you make? And he said, well, I only have two eggs, so I can only make one cake because I only have two eggs. And he said, well, that's your limiting reagent. And he went, oh, I, am, I understand what, what it is. And he said, you know, and then you, you put a baking powder in your, in your cake, right? So that it rises and you have to put it in the oven so that it gets hot. And, and he said, yes, well, you know, that's the energy you're using so that the reaction happens and you have a, it's not kind of like a cat catalyst because the, the baking powder is not a catal catalyst. You don't get it back at the end, but it's what makes it rise. And, and he then said, oh, well, yeah, I understand these things now, but I said, you use funny words. <laughs> and I said, well, that's the language of, of chemistry. So it wasn't the concepts that were difficult. It was the language that was difficult to him. But then when you when you when you kind of like create a, a parallel with something that he's you know pretty used to to doing every day like cooking, he thought okay I, I got this and that changed that so so you know I, and again you know just going back to the original question um, we chemist we we know what we're doing we know what we're talking about um, the fact that somebody doesn't understand it doesn't mean that they are not intelligent or that they're not educated is that we are not. You know, let's put the burden on us to explain it to them in words that they can uh, understand it. Very often, the concepts are not complicated; they are just, uh, you know, a matter of, you know, the the removing those barriers, like the the language, for example. Um, so, yeah, it's I would say it's our fault. Let's work hard on that. Thank you, ma'am. We have a couple of more questions. Uh, is it okay to use the analogies to explain something unfamiliar for the audience and they are a good way of simplifying something they can variably interpret it yeah i mean that's that's a, a, a risk that somebody you know that you create an analogy for somebody and they don't un un understand um but i think i think you are more, more likely to get through to them with something that is close to them. Um, yes, uh, I, I think that is worth, uh, if you can find something that, that works as an, as an analogy, I would say that the, the risk is, is, is worth it because it could be that they remember it you know, forever. Uh, so I'll give you another example. So when I was in secondary school, <laughs> my uh, chemistry teacher, this is in the times when we didn't have in the class, we had a sink uh, at the next to the blackboard, but we didn't have a fume hood or anything like that. 
Um, so he was explaining um, how some uh, ele elements can be hygros hygroscopic and react violently with water. So he took a chunk of sodium out of a bottle that he had in, you know, that kind of oil, and he just threw it in, in the water, <laughs> and then it all sparked and it made a really loud noise, and everybody was, you know, impressed. We all remember that. We all remember <laughs> that you don't mix sodium with, with water, and probably you wouldn't do that to, today, but. Um, you know, and again, that was an, uh, an, an, an analogy that was just, you know, chemistry in, in, in the making, but uh, we all remember that. So um, I think that, you know, sometimes little things like that, you know, are kind of like hooks for your brain to remember certain things and then to build on, on, on that. So I, I would use uh, analogies where, where possible, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, last question for the day. In, uh, in addition, uh, how does one communicate scientific ideas to the people who are misinformed like anti-vaxxers or flat earthers? <laughs> wow, uh, that's a difficult question. It's one with a lot of patience. Um, I find it very frustrating because um, the anti-vax movement is alive and well, unfortunately, in the US, uh, when I was living in the UK, the same thing. And, you know, people were not uh, vaccinating their, their kids. Uh, in the US, even recently, the, I think it was actually, I don't know if it was in the UX. I was in one, it was in one, one of the Pacific Islands. There was a measles um, outbreak again, because people were not, um, in, uh, measles should be, uh, have been eradicated. Um, and it breaks my heart because, you know, this is well-established science and I think the risks are very small, they're well known, you know. Um, I think uh, in terms of how to communicate with those people, I think you have to be very patient. I think you have to really listen to them because this is uh, information probably that was acquired from, you know, the wrong so sources. Uh, so you kind of like need to uh, challenge that. And, uh, and I think that is, is very difficult because there are very um, deeply ingrained um, thoughts or be beliefs in, 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 in many cases. And, and unfortunately, in many cases, they are political as, as well, right? So um, the anti-vax movement is, uh, you know, it has a political color. Uh, you know, if you will have seen in the US, uh, and I don't know if it happened in other places, but uh, uh, there were certain factions that were, you know, political factions that were encouraging their, you know, people of the same kind of uh, ideology not to wear masks and, uh, you know, putting a lot of people and themselves at, at, at risk. And I think that that is something that is very dangerous and that, you know, we hadn't seen to that, that extent, uh, to this extent, you know, be, before, certainly not in my uh, uh, lifetime. So, um, uh, it is it is 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 very very difficult, and I think what we need to do there is you know, try to be consistent in terms of our message, very patient, and then listen listen to um, how these people are 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 getting the information where where they're getting the information from, and try to to challenge that. And 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 I think that you know organizations like Facebook and Twitter and others are you know making some very small efforts to stop the spread of misinformation. I think this is is going to be more and more important, um, and I think that they will have to tighten their uh, you know rules and, and and regulations to make sure that uh, only kind of like you know valid um, consensus in terms of you know vaccines and, and other issues um, you know come into the public eye. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. And I think actually this one, as I was saying right at the beginning of the, of the talk, I think that, you know, we are really, this year, 2021, I think the anti-vax movement is, is going to be very problematic and getting, um, you know, I think that we have to vaccinate about 75% of the population to kind of, you know, go back to normal life. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult. I've, I've been reading um, some, stats where, um, you know, there's, um, I think it was something like 50% of uh, people working in the front, front lines, like um, uh, emergency workers, nurses, that wouldn't take the, the vaccine if it was available. 50%, and these are people who are supposed to, you know, have knowledge and expertise and, you know, and all those kinds of things. So I think that that is uh, 
uh, going to be very difficult. But anyway, patience and consistent messaging. And what I would say as well is that, and this is something that I've, I've noticed with, with this is, um, I, I, me personally as a scientist, I'm very comfortable with guidance changing or, you know, based on sci the scientific process. So, you know, as we discover things, it could be that, you know, our message changes and I'm comfortable with, with that because, uh, uh, in science, there's no facts. There's kind of observations and then consensus around a, a theory, right? But these things change, right? And um, uh, I, I am comfortable with that as a, as a scientist, but you know, non-scientists probably don't understand how the scientific process works. And they probably uh, don't understand that the change in you know, uh, policies or information coming from scientists is part of the process and part of you know, gathering knowledge and understanding the world around us. And they say, well, you know, a lot of people will say, you don't know what you're doing, you're changing your mind. Well, you, you don't change your mind, you just know more. Their audience or interviewers. Right. Okay. Well, so one thing that I would say is that you don't have to ask questions. Sorry, you don't have to answer any questions that you perceive as difficult or where you think that somebody's trying to trick you or anything like that. You can always say, I'm not ready to answer that question. And that's your prerogative. You can always do that. Um, or, you know, you could seek clarification and say, you know, can you repeat your question or, you know, or perhaps in, in, in different words, because I'm not sure what you're trying to ask. Or you could even ask them, why are you asking me that question, right? If you are not sure about their, you know, uh, their uh, objectives with, with that. Um, so so, uh, so, so the, the question again, what, what is it that to say? Um, how to handle difficult questions asked to us yeah. by our audience or interviewers. Yeah, uh, so you don't have to ask, sorry, you don't have to answer questions that you're unsure about. If you think that somebody's asking a question to trick you, um, if you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. Again, it's part of the scientific process. Um, uh, scientists should be comfortable with that. Uh, say, you know, I don't know it, but that is a good question and I'm going to think about it and you know and I'm going to think about how that might impact you know the, the work that I'm, I'm doing and in and, and those those kinds of, of, of things it's okay to say that you don't know yeah there's, there's a lot of things that we don't know we should be humble and um, yeah just yeah I, yeah you don't have to answer anything or just say that you don't know um, do we have any more questions Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vibiana, for there's, there's answering uh, like uh, with great explanation. So, um, Sashi, there is. okay, there is a question. Yeah, yeah, we have a question. This is, yeah. Okay, so the question is: Is there anything that can help a person with stage fright or social anxiety get their point across and sound confident? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, practice. So the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And I had a, a person in my team who suffered from this kind of anxiety and they enroll on a Toastmasters course. Um, so basically this is about, you know, training your kind of like oral co communications with a group of people that have, you know, similar e e issues. And, you know, they kind of, I think they used to get together maybe twice a month and then practice, uh, you know, like they would have some food in, in the, in, like pizza in the evening and then they would take turns to do presentations going from two minutes to five minutes to 10 minutes so they would increase the, the, the length. And then it's a, it's a group of people that they are familiar with because they just had food with. Uh, and it was through practice that she kind of overcame that 
uh, fear and and now she loves it <laughs> which is which is great and not only she loves it she's really good at it she's uh, you know one of the um uh you know the, the 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 people that i really enjoy because she has a lot of energy and i think that that fright uh, uh that anxiety was really not letting her you know shine in you know um kind of like you know group communications you know group presentations and uh, and, and I think that uh, that doing that Toastmasters, which I think she did for over a, a year because then it became a, you know group of, groups of, of friends um, that helped her uh, a lot. So I would say start small, you know you can you know you can say you start at your group meetings and ask a question, right? If you've never asked a question before, uh, you know just just kind of like one step at a time, small tasks. And then you can go from the you know two minutes to five minutes to ten minutes and 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 so on. So, but you know, there's no there's no way around it here. It is it is a practice and set yourself small goals and make sure you achieve them and then you know make them bigger and more ambitious and then all of a sudden you'll be you'll be uh, doing it. And what I would say as well is that if you are nervous, uh, you know what helps is some body exercises as well. Kind of you know breathing in. Uh, 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 very slowly because that slows your heart rate. Um, kind of like you know, shake your arms and do all those kinds of things in your your legs, so your body is, is relaxed. And I know that they do this with um, uh, you know the the uh, uh, racing drivers, like motorbike racing drivers. They do kind of like uh, exercises like this before they go get onto the the motorbike, so that they are not tight, and so you know their bodies are you know flexible. So body exercises, breathing. Uh, a lot slows your your heart rate and um uh, and then you know go from small to to big and also what I would say is that be be confident nobody knows more about your research than you so you are the expert in the room they are there to to listen to so enjoy that you are an expert they want to hear what you have to say so um I think that there's no, they're not going to judge you they're there to absorb information from you so kind of like trying to try to think about that, 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 that way, I think it helps a lot. Yeah, so um, thank you again, Dr. Bibiana. Uh, now we have our uh, principal, Dr. Krishna Priya Mohanraj. Uh, she has a few words to say to you. So please, ma'am. Before the formal vote of thanks by the ACS students chapter of Bombay College of Pharmacy, I would just like to tell Madam, it was such an interesting, uh, uh, first of all, an interesting topic and the way uh, you have handled it, you have given others uh, the message of how science should be communicated. Not only have, uh, uh, you know, you uh, dealt with this topic uh, in your talk, you answered the question so well. And I was very impressed that you even mentioned that, uh, you know, if you don't know something, it's very okay to tell that you do not know it. Because we have to be honest. And uh, another thing that you mentioned was we have to be humble. So, and how we can make things more interesting. I'm very, very happy that even the, uh, the student chapter, there were so many questions asked to you and put forth. And uh, we're very lucky to have you for, uh, you know, this particular session at, uh, uh, connected by the ACS student chapter of Bombay College of Arts. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for, for listening. Yeah, uh, so I invite uh, Soam Aure, Secretary of ACSBCB chapter to give a formal vote of thanks. And uh, then we'll uh, take a picture, you know, we can keep your videos on and... <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Soam Aure, Secretary for the ACS Bombay College of Pharmacy student chapter. And it is my honor to give the vote of thanks today. Truly, it was a very informative webinar on effective communication, which is a very important scientific workplace. I would like to thank our speaker for today, Dr. Bibiana Campos-Sayo, Editor-in-Chief, CNN, and Vice President, CNN Media. 
thank you for giving such beautiful answers for the questions asked and taking time off for your busy schedule i would like to thank our faculty advisor dr krishna ayer our faculty co advisors dr sagar patel and dr elvis martis and the whole acs bcp team for organizing and managing today's webinar i would also like to thank every faculty member for taking time off the busy schedule and attending this webinar i would also like to thank the undergraduate postgraduate and phd students from across the country who have attended this event and have engaged in it with such great interest i would now like to request to switch on the videos for us to take a screenshot of today's participants are you shall be ready yes 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 action yeah yeah we'll wait for everyone to switch on the video and then click thank you ayush um good evening and have a great day everybody we will also be um posting the feedback forms in the chat box so please fill them as soon as possible thank you all for joining thank you dr bibiana thank you thank you bye bye everybody take care of yourselves yes thank you ma'am stay safe ma'am bye ma'am thank you ma'am